Kev. What are you doing here? I'm checking out Robin Boyd's Wall Street house. Welcome. Hi everybody, welcome to Archie Marathon. Today we have the privilege of visiting Robin Boyd's Wall Street house, which was built in 1958 when he was 38. Yeah. And it is awesome because it's the ultimate party house. The ultimate party house, bro. Hello again. Robin Boyd's house. What's really cool about this is when you're coming off, off the street, the house sort of goes down half a level and comes up half a level and it delivers you to the top level. When you wander through, you've got a bathroom, then you come into this space. So ta-da, welcome to the ultimate party pad. This is where they would have their cocktails ready for their friends arriving. Um, but the cool thing about this, talking about optimising space, is that is also where the Boyd slept. Don't bother having a spare bedroom. When everybody goes home, just crash out there. So the main thing about this house is this courtyard that we're in. And it divides the front part we came in from to the children's pavilion at the back. And it has a draping tensile roof. But as you can imagine, this is quite unconventional and for a house to have a courtyard. Literally, you have to walk outside between the two parts. Yeah, this is one of those ideas that I think a lot of architects try to try on with clients, is let's create two wings to the house uh, and you can walk through the garden and most people start, but what? It's you know, cold, no, it's, it's cold. cold. Yeah, and so this is you know, it's sort of an in-between space. It's the roof's off and it's a garden space. But he's also put up these glass walls that help in terms of just controlling the wind and control the temperature a little bit. But yeah, the ultimate party house, it's interesting that at one end you've got the kitchen and a bathroom, somewhere to hang out that also becomes where you sleep, uh, the dining area and the lounge below all flowing into this space. But then the other wing of the house is the kids' wing and it really becomes a case of kids, you know what, it's late and the adults are going to booze on right now, probably do a key party. <laughs> Go to your end of the house and it really is a separate structure. It's quite transparent though, no? Yeah, nowhere to hide. Actually, that's really interesting. I, yeah, I hadn't really thought of that. Get away! Go to bed, yeah, you can see them. You, get back to bed. <laughs> but yeah, he was 38 when, when this uh, opened. So yeah, he, he was, uh, I guess, still prime age to party, I guess. Yeah, and young in the scheme of things for an architect back then. You know, 45 was considered still emerging. 55 was when most architects were starting to do uh, some serious work. In 2005, uh, the house came up for sale and in this area, land is incredibly expensive. So it was no doubt going to be bought, demolished, and then a McMansion with a six car garage was going to be installed in its place. So a bunch of people got together and scraped together <laughs> some money and actually managed to save the house and create what's called the, Bro the Robin Royd. <laughs> The Robin Boyd Foundation. That's what they created. So this is now a house museum that you can visit. Yeah. So check out the description below. We'll put links there. Yeah, this tour is roughly fortnightly where you can come and check it out. And I, I think come and do that. It helps fund the care of the house. Um, and also you'll get lots of super interesting stories and facts, which we won't tell you right now, because what we're going to do is talk about the different qualities the spaces, the structural intent, and all the things that we like talking about, but there are amazing stories to be told. So definitely go to the Robin Boyd website and join in one of those tours. But today, we'll do an Archie Marathon tour. So Robin Boyd wrote a book called The Australian Ugliness uh, about how the terrible state of the Australian suburbs were and how ugly and how out of control it was. Two years after he moved into his house. Yeah, he wrote it up there that has huge influence on the Australian design scene. He was also invited to teach at MIT in Boston 
Uh, and during the time there, he, I guess he spent time and looked at, at the same time being built, the Yale Hockey Rink by Eero Saarinen. It does have a strong reminiscence of the hockey rink there. So yeah, a cable roof, you can't build a conventional structure. Um, there's lessons to be learned, but this is actually quite a small roof. And it's interesting when you look at the structure, the primary beam that's, that's basically pulling back uh, the cables is angled. So everywhere else you look at the structure, you know, you're talking about column and beam, where this is actually working with the load. So it's actually angled and that's tethering back um, the cable. And there are huge bracing elements in the party walls, on the, on the side walls, that actually pulls the, the cable back. So there's a huge diagonal bracing inside the brickwork. So structurally, these two are acting like bookends that are trying to be pulled together by these cables. So it's always acting in tension. It's really, really interesting. We come in the front door, there's cupboards, so take off your coats and dump your umbrellas, and then head straight through, you can see the garden. But it's interesting when you look into this space. So this is storage and bathroom right near the entry. Facing west, so you get this highlight that's letting in lots of light, but then another window on the other side, so an interior bit of glazing, so that lets light go into that, that uh, loft space. And then if we actually have a look in here, we can see the wall that Kev mentioned before, that's actually like a bracing wall that's holding it back. And look at the top there, you've got this steel beam that's angled in the direction of the, of the load. So those cables are desperately trying to collapse in that way, and that big steel beam is holding them back. Clever. You know what that is? That is the chimney flue. No, that is the exhaust for the kitchen. Yeah, so services are all stacked in one area. So right near the street, so you've got very short runs of servicing coming to the kitchen and then stacked directly above that, the, uh, the bathrooms, all of your water, electricity, your flue. And not only that though, the street, not only does it offer a buffer uh, for acoustic reasons, but also thermal reasons. Because if that is west, then that, this zone here actually gets quite warm. This gets crazy hot. I've yeah. been in summer parties here and yeah, it stabilizes the temperature in there, but you go to hang a whiz, like, that's fine. Yeah, that's why there's an air conditioner right above you. Oh yeah, one of those really cranky old ones. On theme as well, like with the brass finish, which you'll see throughout the house. You see it on the flue, you see it on the AC. It's the, the bling, the brass bling. So they raised three kids here. And you know, everybody freaks out. What about the children and safety? Like, have a look at this. No balustrade along there. I think it's more dangerous for the adults are all boozing on. Um, and as I said before, that beam that's outside, that wasn't there either. So people are forced to take responsibility for their own actions and not fall off. Even the bookcase that's behind you. Like imagine, they, sit, they put drinks here and people can sort of sit down and chill out. That's a, a void going down to a brick floor there. That's not compliant. And I love it. You know, sort of nanny state stuff of stopping everybody from falling over. You know you're alive when you're in a house that's threatening to kill you. <laughs> so we were just in the bathroom, you can see the two lots of glazing and then the flue going down. And if you follow that down, it goes straight down into the kitchen there. Very rational. Oh, and then also the primary post is coming and getting hidden behind that flue as well, which is also in line with the cable. We were just told before that um, wherever you see the beading on the timber, see how there's some that are missing and then you've got beading in other places? They only exist because this was actually a, this is actually a bitumen roof, so pouring hot bitumen on and waiting for it to settle. And then where it would start to drip through in between boards, he'd go and put beading across just where he needed it and not where he didn't. So people supposedly have been here for ages going, what's the pattern? Is it mathematics? What is it? It's just pragmatics. I love this too. So from here, you look at the way that the tensile roof works and the cable goes down and the opening that's for the garden and that captures beautifully just the old roofs of the terrace homes beyond. Yeah, that slot is perfect if you just passed out right here. <laughs> you can see right through to the Dandenongs, to the mountains. See all that way. Oh yeah. But I, th I think that's cool. Like you don't have a redundant bedroom. It's like. See you guys, close the door on your way out, and then you just... That's how you roll all the time. Yeah, I don't even make it upstairs to bed. 
And then your mates can just like crash there. It's a pretty comfy carpet. It's much better without that beam. Like sitting here, that beam's <laughs> be totally in the way. <laughs> This is cool because you actually can get really close to the to the roof now. So you can really see the way it's constructed. Very simple. It's just cable, lining boards, plywood on top, bitumen roof. So this house is full of these details. Like this is basically a hard tent more than a home. Like look at this, look at the head of the door. There's a little gap through it. And the same thing happens downstairs where- So for those who can't see, there's actually a pane of glass here. Yeah. And the door, I'll show you. So it's literally frameless. Yes, and it follows through. Like this glazing continues. So it stops here at this floor level, but it continues, the same details continue downstairs and you'll actually see that the glass just passes past the brick. So it looks really beautiful and elegant. But of course, same thing here, big air gap. So there's lots of uh, rugging up and wearing blankets rather than trying to heat the house too much. Do you remember that episode we talked about the Merkit house and the two forms going past each other and then the change in direction of the flooring? What's really great about this is you come in and you have a carpeted area that goes through into the bathroom and then you have this space where there's actually cork and there's gaps between it. And then the stairs go down and then you have the red carpeted area. So he's really, through material and separation, describing a service zone, an in-between zone, circulation zone, and then a plush red party zone. I guess also having the gaps in between also suggests that there's a verticality to it, that the fact that you can go downstairs from here. Yeah, and you can see it through there as well. And they're roughly the same size of the treads, as if the treads continued, it just went, okay, we'll just go flat now instead of continuing yeah. up. I was here one night and I was trying to leave and I'd had a couple of drinks too many. Not in the 60s, I'm not that old. Um, and I got a bit confused here because I was sort of lines and I was like, wait, is there more? No, it's okay, I believe you. That is so you. <laughs> cork. So if you have a look, what's interesting is cork is used for the top of the cabinets, the tables, uh, so the dining table, um, the little settee down there. And there's something about it that suggests you know, that it's softer, easy to use, easy to replace, but also to me, it feels like it's transient. It, it could be removed at any time and he's used the same language for the Is that a cue for the wine bottle? Hmm? Cork. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. That's how much they drank is they just used all the old cork bottles. Oh, yes, maybe. That's sustainable. <laughs> Natural light at the end of a circulation path. We do that all the time. That's just where you get more, more wood for this fire from. More brass, more bling. From this point, you can see that that is really a mezzanine space. That he's designed a two-story space and then he's fit this mezzanine in between. So on both sides, there's a tall gap. You can see right up to the glazing of the bathroom. So you've still got Western light coming through. And that opens straight down where you've got this structural grid, you can see all the columns, they go all the way through and they line up with the cables in the roof. And then on each side, one of those structural bays runs right down where there's a door on this side and on that side. So form, space and order, you know, this is an example of all of it. Really playful space, but there's so much order here. Where the structure comes down for this mezzanine, that's like the infill space, we've got columns that sit on each end. Hung off those columns is this storage bay that's lifted off the floor so natural light bounces through towards the kitchen and that's also the exact unit that the stairs run down. Yeah? So it's not just playful, it's structurally logical. Then you've got these double beams so they've just simply bolted through so structurally really easy to make on both of the bays and that's where he's hidden his lighting. So unless you're standing here, at no point do you actually see a bulb. You, you always see secondary light. You always see light bouncing off something. But of course, when you have a table, you often want intimacy. So the light is directly over the top of the table. Very clever, very simple. Service bay, interstitial space with two glass doors on either end, and then the living space. So upstairs we look at the bathroom, 
down here, separated by the structural grid, so the columns, is the kitchen. So in 1958, in that era, you hid the kitchen away. It's where the servicing was done and you hid all the mess. This was considered very avant-garde because of its connection, not only to the living space, but all the way throughout into the garden. So instead of just bringing the hors d'oeuvres and the cocktails out, people could actually hang around here. Um, so it was Mrs. Boyd, the story goes, that was in the kitchen and pushing food and hors d'oeuvres and things like that. You can actually have a conversation with people. Uh, and then there's just tons and tons of storage all through here, but it's not taking up a huge amount of space. There's not like a huge pantry, but there's still actually really pragmatic you know, use of space. Everything's just at hand, like at hand. Very clever. The pots and pans too, that's on the wall. <laughs> they are not accidental. All the bling bling is actually in this direction. And that goes with the fact that if you look back from the living room, the end of the stairs, end of those details, that's part of the look. Yeah. Lush red carpet in the chill out zone upstairs. And you come downstairs, you go down the cork, and then you actually have a brick floor here. So this is all about being robust and hard wearing and feeling somewhat like an outdoor space so that it flows where you get more brickwork going along the two doorways and then the um, slate in the middle. Even the way the two beams, the double beams and the lighting, this space in here, this is using the bay, the structure, to define this room. There's a room within the room defined by the structure. Yep. It's interesting what you say about this being a room in a room because the, you could imagine sort of an AXO series of diagrams. It's really simple brick walls with a tensile roof creating a two-storey space. Service block at its one end, mezzanine added through, but I haven't even considered that before. Using these structural elements, you're part of a two-storey space, but it creates a really intimate space just here. So it really centres you. Quite deliberately, the glazing runs past the brickwork. It doesn't run into the edge of the brickwork. It runs past the brickwork. So it's very clear that this is almost a, service, a, a, a surface applied against the masonry. The property boundary is actually another metre and a half on either side of these walls and the, um, and the glass line over there. So there is more garden behind this, behind the glass. Someone asked, someone sort of say, oh, we, we don't have access to that because, oh, we wasted all that land. But, you know, it is part of the, the depth and the illusion that it creates. You've got the space and then you've got more garden behind it um, and then the wall. Yeah, it means it doesn't matter what your neighbours do, you're protected because you've got this buffering space that you've created for yourself. It also means you don't need a dirty great shed. Like these outside parts beyond the walls become utility spaces. Whenever there's an event on, that's quite often where they stack extra gear. They can hide all the stuff. From... I've just noticed, not so much here, but on that side, you can see there's a vent there. So I would imagine there's a thickness in the wall and there's air conditioning and vents. Yeah, in the in the walls. So the walls not only does it hide the structural services, but actually it hides the mechanical services. Mm. Let's go have a look. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Why are we whispering? Secret. I don't think I've been out that door. Yeah, let's check it out. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. So you've got the air intake. Is that what that one is? Then you come out here and there's a huge, huge system. Ah, hidden. And there's that space we're talking about beyond. There are so many lessons about lighting. So many houses are overlit. Like it's the worst. It's super bright houses. This one has been underlit. As I said before, there's no globes that you can see. And the same thing happens with the lighting externally. The lights are on the outside of the glass walls. So you always it's lighting up the greenery, which then reflects back and lights up the space. So it gives even more depth to the space. Yep. I've never been here on this side. This is cool. Cute little pond. There's a couple of ponds actually. There's one at the front as well. And instead of just formalizing a pond, what I love about this landscaping is it's as though um, you know, they've just removed a few pavers and it's revealed this pond below. And the same thing with the planting is it's just the gap between pavers instead of doing a little bordered landscaping bed. You'll you'll love this, Kev. Um, look oh at yeah, the, wow. Look at the level of care. So when you open this door. And it's got the same detail, no head above it. And then when you open it around here, look what it lines up with. It lines up with the frame. So much thought. And does a latch close there? 
Yeah, there's a little latch hanging off the beam. It almost, almost disappears. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the beam at the other end in the bathroom? Big angular beam that ties the cables down? Have a look up here. So this beam, so beams typically act vertically. <laughs> Yeah, Stop things bending down. Flat. This one's horizontal because it's being pulled that way. So you've got these two huge beams that are working in opposition to keep it, you know, tensile, to keep it stretched. Very cool. And also it's offset from the wall, so it act actually acts as a um, helmet. It yeah, that's hides right. hides the light. Similar to the two timber beams over the dining table, they actually hide the globes behind it. So it washes the light. Clever. Now this I love, I love these kind of ideas. So remember I've said a couple of times, the two doors coming down each side, the circulation paths. The eldest daughter, who was away at boarding school most of the time, she, when she would come and stay, she had the opportunity, this was her room, to go, you know what, I don't want to hang out with the rest of the kids. She'd get her cupboard door and put it there and say, no go zone. You guys can walk around the other, other side. I love that, it's so simple. Similar ideas to upstairs, where when you're not sleeping in it, it has other functions. It acts like a lounge. It's not just dedicated to sleeping. The amazing Featherstone chairs. I believe this was meant to be the study. He actually ended up writing the book upstairs. And then, where are his? And two other bedrooms. I mean, this is all you need, isn't it? Somewhere to sleep. Look at the beautiful timbers. Like the size that bedrooms have become nowadays just seems crazy. The size of Australian houses seems to be crazy. You look at this house for a family of five that partied all the time, so had heaps of visitors, versus the size of houses that are, we're now building in Australia. The Why? The smell of timber is amazing. After all these years? Mm. You've got a structural grid straight through the middle of the house. And then you've got this door that's centered on the house. You come through to two different bedrooms, two different bedrooms either side. So behind this door, right on that main axis, this must be pretty special, don't you reckon? Ah, <sighs> crescendo. It is pretty cool though. Like when you come out of here, you get the whole house. You get this grid line straight through the garden and back towards the main living space. And the light all around you, like a halo. Yeah. You're like a saviour coming after you've done your <laughs> business. It's like all my favourite toilets, it's a loo with a view. You get a view of the treetops. Ah. Oh, and a view from the shower too. That's awesome. Hi neighbours. Hi. So a sustainable home, you need double glazing and thermally broken frames. Not back in 1958, you didn't. Look, at, it's a beautiful detail. Single glazing coming down, running past the brickwork. Look at that gap. It looks gorgeous. Yeah, it looks like the, the inside, just, what it looks like there's no frame, literally. It looks like there's no window. Yeah, and I have no doubt people have run into this glass before. Yeah, broke, kicked it. <laughs> beautiful detail. It's worth visiting though. Uh, there are just so many little ideas and details, and it's interesting when you're here with other people. They're always being, they're always discovering little things. We've only scratched the surface. Definitely come and visit the Wall Street House if you get a chance, as many times as you can in lots of different types of weather.